want to make a quick public service announcement and preface before we dive into this video. The nature of the said content in this video is going to be for mature audiences. So if you are someone who is a youth or so if you are a parent who has youth in the room, I definitely recommend going ahead and either turning off this video or maybe if you're a parent who's wanting to learn the information that's going to be presented um, to go ahead and pause this video and either have the children go somewhere else or um, perhaps uh, go ahead and exit out and come back to this video later. The reason is it because we are going to be specifically talking about sins against the sixth and ninth commandments today, which are going to be sins against the virtue of purity. This lecture video title is called Why Lust Leads More Souls Than Any Other to Hell. If you want to find out the answer to that, stay tuned for this video. Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to the traditional Thomas. For those of you tuning in for the first time, welcome. My name is Nicholas Cavazos. It's so good to have you here. Thank you so much for stopping by. Um, I've been on a bit of a hiatus over the last couple of weeks, and so I haven't posted a video, I think, in around two weeks or so. I am still a college student, right? still enjoying the world of education. However, I am someone who definitely loves the education that I'm learning as of right now, anyway, it, it's just absolutely wonderful getting to go into so many different subjects uh, in the world of liberal arts that I love uh, and getting to really just take that time to sit down and read and to write uh, has been such a blessing. Today, we're going to be going ahead, though, and diving into a um, kind of a touchy subject, a subject that demands uh, me to um, more than ever speak in a in an, a becoming way, in a way that is in accordance with the virtue of modesty. Um, and so today we're going to be talking specifically about the sin of impurity, right? Sins against the sixth and ninth commandment. Some can call this, and I think it's an apt com uh, an apt way of calling this, the spirit of fornication, right? That is in our own age. And so I'm wanting to go ahead and preface this, which uh, with this, which is that I'm going to in this video try to speak in a manner which is um, chaste, which is modest, which is becoming to the said subject, but also in a way which shows the severity of the said subject because impurity is not a thing to joke about. It's not a thing to make light of. It is not a thing to treat as a lesser sin or just like, you know, maybe an uncomfortable habit someone would have. My friends, impurity is a very serious sin. It is a sin which damns more souls to hell than all others. And in my estimation, it is the greatest plague uh, on Western civilization today, certainly here in the United States, but I'm sure maybe for viewers who are watching from other countries, perhaps in Western Europe, you can probably attest to the fact that uh, different forms of impurity have uh, just engulfed, if you will, um, the entire culture, whether that culture be uh, in the context of media, whether it be in the context of academia, whether it be in the context of um, just civil society and civil life, right? We see this sin of impurity um, being praised and celebrated and um, vaunted in the face of those servants of God who strive to live in a way that is becoming not just to our Lord, but to our fellow man. And so today we're going to be diving into specifically three large references and resources that are going to be describing this said vice of impurity, right? But we're also going to be treating of the means and methods of the church of how she recommends that a soul who is in the, the, the latches of Satan, right, in this area of impurity can become free by the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, we're going to be talking about three things, and we're going to be lining them out in this specific order. First, we're going to be talking about specifically the virtue of chastity, right, and the virtue of virginity. And we're going to be using specifically for that the reference Father Prumer's great moral theology. For those of you who do not know who Father Prumer is, Father Prumer was a great Dominican uh, Thomistic theologian, 
of the latter half of the 19th century and the early portion of the 20th century, who wrote many great works on moral theology. I would argue probably his most famous work today is just his handbook on moral theology, which is his shorter of two large treatises on that said subject. Uh, Re until recently, you could pretty much only find it in a PDF copy uh, online or uh, maybe at a used bookstore or Amazon in a used book setting or something like that. Today, however, thankfully, Sophia Press uh, has actually put out a centenary edition with the uh, forward being written by Father Chad Ripperger, right, the great fraternity of St. Peter Priest. Um, and uh, I recommend you go ahead and get that. So I'll go ahead and put a link in the description below if you'd like to go ahead and get it. I think it's twenty dollars something like that i could be wrong uh but for the price uh for the value of what you're getting for the price it's actually extremely good uh, i think it's very very helpful the second reference we're going to be looking at specifically is the holy scriptures right we're going to be specifically using the traditional dewey reams translation of the bible i've said it before and i'll say it again i think the dewey reams is the best translation not the only but the best translation for uh, english-speaking catholics to be using one day again i'll get around to making a video on why i think the Dewey Reams is the best translation, but we'll save that video for another day. The final resource that we're going to be using in this is we're going to be talking uh, about St. Alphonsus, right? His great moral theology, right? That has uh, until recent years remained just in Latin, but is now being translated slowly but surely by the great Dr. Ryan Grant of Mediatrics Press. I'll go ahead and also put that in the link of the description below. Father uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori is my second favorite doctor of the church right after St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and we'll actually in the future, right, without spoiling too much of it, be getting way more into St. Alphonsus. However, uh, for the time being, uh, St. Alphonsus' moral theology Right, he's known as the great doctor of moral theology in the church. Right, his teaching is perfect and pure, uh, in a sense, on this matter. And so, I think consulting him is not only prudent, but it's also going to be very practically helpful for us uh, to go on. So, again, real quick to cover the three things that we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about specifically, right, uh, what is the virtue of chastity, right? What is the virtue of virginity? What is the virtue of modesty? The second thing we're going to be talking about specifically is the vice of impurity. So, we're going to be talking about that in the context of um, what is it, right? We're going to be talking about specifically the different types of sins, right? The natural, and I'm going to put that in air quotes right now because we'll clarify it later on, the natural, right, sins of impurity, and then the unnatural, right, sins of impurity. And then finally, step number three, we're going to get into the remedies in which our Holy Mother Church gives us in her traditional manuals. All right, with all that being said, let's go ahead and say a prayer to the Virgin Most Chaste so that we can proceed forward uh, in a manner which is becoming to our Lord's dignity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, by thy pure and immaculate conception, keep my body pure and my soul holy, and preserve me this night free from mortal sin. St. Joseph, terror of demons, pray for us. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. St. Alphonsus Liguori, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, everyone, so we're going to go ahead now and turn specifically to Father Primer's work, which I'm going to go ahead and put up on the screen for you, and then we'll dive in. All right, everyone, here we are at Father Primer, right? This is an online copy of uh, this on Census Fidelium. I'll go ahead and put this also in the link of the description below. If I can remember, if I don't, please remind me, and I'll go ahead and do that. Um, however, again, I'm wanting to stress... We're going to be talking about these things uh, in a in a way which is becoming right in a way in which is fulfilling the virtue of modesty, because we need to recognize that on the one hand we don't want to be throwing out terms and phraseologies um, that have to do with this said sin, or even these this said uh, maybe even the good context 
of procreation. Uh, and we don't want to be throwing out these terms, uh, these kind of modern secular terms or curses in a loose manner, right? That would be something which would be impure, right? Which would not be becoming with modesty. But also at the same time, we don't want to say nothing, right? And so therefore, by saying nothing, we never actually get into the remedies of how we talk about these things. And so I'm going to be trying to speak in a way which is very helpful, right? Uh, in a way which is becoming with that. So again, um, please pray for me uh, to go forward in that said manner. All right, so he go ahead, uh, how this book is laid out. He lays it out very much so in that classic um, dogmatic tract form, uh, although this one being pertaining to specifically moral theology. And in his uh, treatment of the virtue of temperance, right, that virtue uh, that is one of the th uh, four cardinal virtues, right, that we receive uh, in a supernatural sense, right, we have in a natural sense uh, being born with, but we receive a kind of a supernatural moral um uh, sense of this right through baptism. Um, he treats of chastity and virginity in this part of his book. And he begins right here. He says right here, as you can see, article uh, three, chastity and virginity. So he says, okay, let's first start off with some definitions, right? What is these? What are these two things? So chastity is the virtue which moderates the desire for venereal pleasure in accordance with the dictates of right reason. Right. This is a great and traditional definition of this, right? Chastity, again, is a virtue which moderates or chastises, I believe is the word that St. Thomas Aquinas uses, chastises or moderates the desire for venereal, right? That being carnal pleasure, right? In accordance with the dictates of right reason, right? Remember, we are a body soul composite. We have intellect, will, and passions. And our intellect is, in a certain specific sense, the highest faculty, right? And so we want to. Um, with our reason, right, with our intellect, um, chastise or moderate, right, the carnal appetites that are inside of our lower natures um, in order to, right, one, combat those said things uh, whenever they are immoderate or inordinate, but also so that we can press onward, right, in this great virtue. And so he continues and he says, whereas the chastity of married persons moderates the desire, right, because, right, we see in, for instance, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, St. Paul talks about married persons having to abstain from carnal relations or from uh, the uh, conjugal act in certain circumstances. He says the chastity of widows and virgins uh, excludes the desire entirely, right? So for those who are widows or those who are virgins, right, they are not allowed to engage in any, right, any type of uh, carnal delectation or um, sensual pleasures. He says, now, modesty is a special aspect or part, right, of chastity, for it concerns itself with the external behavior, such as suggestive looks, words, and touches. We see, my friends, in, I believe it's Galatians chapter 5, right, uh, verses 22 going down. Um, we see this reality when we're looking at, for instance, the fruits of the Holy Ghost. We see that modesty, right, is one of the fruits traditionally of the Holy Ghost. And modesty we generally think of as um pertaining to external clothing, right? That is generally how we see it in our Western secular society. And absolutely, it should be seen in that light because, um, if you will, on a practical level, that is like the first thing in a certain sense which a, which a person sees about another soul. However, we have to recognize that it is not something which is just about the clothing, right? Uh, I'm definitely old school, right? I'm, I'm firm in the, in the world of, you know, People wearing good, modest clothing and clothing which definitely shows the distinction of your gender. However, we have to recognize that modesty also, right, is becoming to our looks and to our words and to our touches, right? How are we to look at another person, right? How are we to use our words, right, as I've been talking about in this said video, right? How are we going to, for instance, touch another person, right? There's a, there's a difference even if you're wanting to get down in moral theology. There's a, there's a difference, for instance, to use maybe um, – a, a less serious example, but that could become serious. There's a difference between a person, say, who wants to hug a person who's in a time of grief, right? Someone who, say, a friend or a family member or someone that you know who's suffering the loss of a loved one or suffering the loss of some type of, um, right, friendship or, or, or relation that was dear to them some type of traumatic experience and going and giving that person a hug to say, I am there, right? There's a difference between that and a person who wants to say, go and hug another person for some type of carnal delectation that that person could um, receive from that said action. And we have to recognize that uh, 
of those two examples, one of those is perfectly fine and normal, and the other one of those things would be mortally sinful, right? We have to recognize that uh, this sin is very serious and very um, – very concerning. With that being the case, he's going to go ahead here, and as you can see down here, he says, chastity is a distinct virtue since it has its own object, and a difficult one at that, right? The object being the moderation of venereal pleasure, right? Chastity, my friends, is not uh, an easy virtue, right? It is something um, that, unfortunately, uh, immorality, right, impurity is bound up in our fallen human nature, but it preys upon our natural and good, right, desire for procreation, but it twists it in an ordinate manner, in a manner in which is against reason. So that being the case, I want to go ahead and before we continue going onward, talk about the seriousness of this sin, specifically getting a couple references from St. Alphonsus's Great Moral Theology. St. Alphonsus right, says in his Great Moral Theology on this said subject, he says quite a bit on it, but he does say this, and I think that this is a good way of trying to show or illustrate what we're talking about. He says, he says this in his treatise, we quote, now we reluctantly undertake to treat this matter indeed the name of which is enough to infect the minds of men. I ask the chase reader to forgive me if he will find it discussed and clarified here a great many questions and circumstances that have been omitted, right, by certain theologians that have come before him, right? He gives the example of Father Bernsbaum. He says, and he says this with an exclamation point, would that I were able to explain myself more briefly and obscurely, right? That is how we need to operate. He says, Yet, since this matter is more frequent and abundant in confessions, and on account of which a greater number of souls fall into hell, I do not hesitate to assert that everyone who has been damned has been damned on account of this one vice of sexual impurity, or at least not without it. Right? Let me repeat that again to emphasize the reality of this. He says, I do not hesitate to assert that everyone who has been damned was damned on account of this one vice of sexual impurity, or at least not without it. My friends, this is something that is extremely serious, right? The multitudes of souls who are in hell, right, are in hell because of this said sin of impurity. I'm going to go ahead and, if I can remember, put some links down in the description below on some sermons from St. Alphonsus talking about this said sin of impurity. St. Alphonsus goes forward, and this is uh, one reason why we're wanting to talk about specifically um, how chastity, right, when he talks about the the object being difficult. Why is the object difficult? Why is the object hard to attain? He's going to be talking about this thing, which is called the paucity of matter, right? For those of you who are more um, scholastically inclined, you might know what this term means. But for those of you who do not know, we're basically asking this, ourselves the question, does the the sin uh, sins of impurity sins against the sixth and ninth commandment what is the matter that is involved in these said sins when we look at the question of whether x y or z is a mortal sin we look at three qualifications right we look at first off did you commit this said sin right with full knowledge right did you commit this said sin number two with full will and thirdly did we commit this said sin right is this said sin objectively grave right so St. Uh, Aquinas, right, St. Saint, Saint Alphonsus Liguori talks specifically about what is the uh, matter involved? Is this a grave matter? And he says, because of the paucity of matter that is involved in this said sin, this said sin essentially is essentially right at always mortally sinful because, right, and we'll get into some of the distinctions, but because it plays on our natural and good um, desire for procreation. Let me give you this analogy. When we compare, for instance, the sixth and ninth commandment to, say, the third commandment, we recognize that with the third commandment, there is the reality that um, when our Lord, uh, when our Lord right, uh, on Mount Sinai tells to the prophet Moses, he says, um, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. There's many distinctions and questions that we can maybe raise in that said thing. For instance, you know, what does it truly mean to honor the Sabbath day? What does uh, omitting ne necessary or work not of necessity, what does that mean? However, we all, because of the way that God creates us, have this natural and good desire for procreation, right, inside of us. That in and of itself, right, a desire for procreation is not a bad thing. However, 
because of our fallen human nature, we have this so built into our nature that we don't need to have, quote unquote, full knowledge or full will when it comes to a lot of these things, because they are naturally um, known to us in a certain sense, right? They are, they are part of our human nature. So that being the case, we have to recognize that the object of overcoming this is difficult. To continue now on and to show the, the reality and the gravity of this, he says, Virginity is a firm resolution of abstaining from all venereal pleasure made by one who has never been a partner to a sexual act. Virginity is sometimes understood as referring to bodily integrity, which is lost by men by voluntary pollution in women by lustful rupture of the virginal hymen. Therefore, if a person loses it with the integrity of surgical operation or by voluntary attack, virtue of virginity remains intact unless this act is accompanied by voluntary lustful pollution. The virtue of virginity is, pro uh, is in its proper sense, voluntarily integrity is sufficient. Otherwise, we must assert that all young persons living chaste lives, even though they intend to enter in upon marriage at the proper time, possess this virtue of virginity as distinct from the virtue of chastity, which seems unlikely to be true. Therefore, it is the teaching of the theologians that there is also required a firm resolve of preserving chastity always through reverence of God, since the virginity of the vestral virgins and of the others of non-religious motives is not distinct, is not a distinct virtue. According to St. Thomas and other theologians, virginity is not to be commit is not to be considered a distinct virtue unless confirmed so. He talks a little bit about the excellence of this. He says the excellence of the state of the virtue of virginity is extolled in the sacred scriptures, right? We see this, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 7, 25, and in the book of the Apocalypse, by the fathers of the church and by reason itself. For virgins refrain from all venereal pleasure with the express intention of devoting themselves more freely and perfectly to the service of God, which is not only lawful, but exceedingly praiseworthy. The objections raised against virginity on the grounds that it is unnatural and injurious to bodily health care are of no value, right? The arguments, my friends, of the secular world, which say that uh, one ought to uh, not be a virgin, right? This could be injuring or damaging to your body, right? These arguments are of no value. They're absolutely worthless arguments. Now that we've established specifically point number one, what is that? We're going to talk about uh, what is virginity, what is chastity. We're going to now talk about uh, the vices that are contrary to chastity in purity. And as you can see, he's laid this out essentially in five brackets, right? So he says in this article is divided into five paragraphs. First, impurity in general. So we're going to define it. We're going to try to understand what it is. Number two, internal sins of impurity. Number three, unconsummated sins of impurity. Number four, natural consummated sins of impurity. And again, you can kind of put that in air quotes for our own vernacular language, that term natural. And number five, unconsummated sins of impurity, right? So we're going to get now right here into definition, uh, part number one, impurity in general. So the definition, this is what impurity is, my friends. Impurity is an inordinate desire for venereal pleasure, right? That's just what it is. Inordinate, so against reason, right? It is a uh, unreasonable desire for uh, venereal pleasure. Uh, and it's an immoral, right? That's what inordinate also means. Venereal pleasure arises from the movement of those organs and sections or secretions which aid in the acts of procreation and reaches its summit in a healthy man in the venereal, in the, in the pleasure accompanying the emission of seed or in the woman in use by the age of puberty in the diffusion of some secretion of the sexual glands, right? This is what specifically venereal pleasure is. Um, and it is, so it is just that natural um, arising of pleasures that one can get from, right, these said actions that are involved in the uh, conjugal action. He says, uh, now the principle, he says direct, and this is the thing that I think is maybe the helpful and practical thing um, to know about how to combat this. He says directly, directly voluntary sexual pleasure outside of marriage is grievously sinful and never admits of slight matter, right? This is what we're talking about with St. Alphonsus, right? That if we directly, right, and voluntarily, right, um, try to gleam some type of carnal pleasure outside of marriage, that this is always grievously or mortally sinful, right? That's what kind of a theological term that you'll see in the scholastic world for uh, mortally, right? Sometimes it's grievously sinful and never admits a slight matter, right? So there's, it, it really um, is no such thing as mortal or excuse me, as a venial, 
when it comes to directly voluntary, right? There is no such thing. He does say how, though, indirectly voluntary sexual pleasure may either be mortal or venial or no sin at all, right? The key word here is indirectly, right? Or directly, as in the former case. If you're directly trying to glean some type of carnal pleasure outside of marriage, right? It is always mortally sinful, right? And so this includes everything from things that people would consider maybe very light today, right? Things like holding hands or hugging or kisses or things along that nature, all the way up to more explicit, right, uh, immoralities. Indirectly, though, right, if we're not trying to gleam some type of uh, carnal pleasure, right, this could still be mortal, but it could be venial or it could not be a sin at all, right, depending on the situation. Now, he gets into this a bit more, and he says the first part of this principle is admitted by everyone, meaning all the theologians, right? That all the theologians agree that directly willing this is a mortal sin. Since all venereal pleasure is in some way related to the act of procreation, which is the uh, which for the highest reasons has been forbidden by God outside of the state of marriage, right? Again, the state of marriage, right, is ordered to, on a natural level, right, the uh, procreation of children procreation and raising of children, right? So therefore, any type of set action in which one is just trying to gain um, some type of carnal delectation outside of matrimony, right, uh, just for the sake of that its own end, right, would be mortally sinful, directly known, of course. Accordingly, he has issued a grave prohibition against any form of venereal pleasure that is directed voluntarily and not merely the highest pleasure accompanying the act of pollution, right? Right. This is important to recognize. He's not saying that it is just when someone goes and commits some type of high action, right? The highest action being, um, you know, the act of pollution itself, right? Um, that would be sinful, but rather all things that lead up to that, right? So uh, you can think of this in the context of any said action, right? That could lead up to that said end of pollution would also be sinful, right? And he says, and indeed, anyone who directly wills even the slightest degree of venereal pleasure is in prox uh, proximate danger of proceeding further, and it is always grievously sinful to expose oneself without sufficient reason to the proximate danger of falling into sin. This is probably something that the average priest, unfortunately, does not teach about to the faithful, and this is something which is very concerning. We have to recognize, my friends, that even, as he puts it here, even the slightest degree of venereal or carnal pleasure that is directly willed, or if we put ourselves into the occasion of sin without some type of sufficient means for that said thing, right, that it is always grievously sinful because of the proximity to danger of falling into that said sin, right? So we have to ask ourselves a bunch of practical questions now, things like, for instance, if I know that this said person, right, uh, is an occasion of sin for me because I, I, I tend to um, engage in maybe impure thoughts, right, toward a said person, or this person, right, and I commit impure actions together, or this said person, right, speaks uh, very immodestly about these types of things, right? Um, this, if I sit here, right, this is an occasion of sin. If I don't have any type of sufficient reason for being here, right? Then this is uh, putting myself in the proximate occasion of falling into sin, and it is always grievously or mortally sinful, right? We have to recognize that. But we can apply this to people. We can apply this to TV shows, right? We can apply this to social media. We can apply this to a whole host of things, right? We have to recognize the severity of this. He says the second part of this principle follows. From what has been said already uh, regarding the acts that are indirectly voluntary, venereal pleasure that is voluntary in its cause implies that the pleasure is not sought for itself, but is the accompaniment of some other action performed by the agent. For instance, a young person reading a book may foresee that sexual pleasure may be caused by such reading. In this form of pleasure, there is not always a uh, present, but a proximate danger of consenting to the complete act, and thus it is not always grievously sinful. To judge in practice whether venereal pleasure that is voluntary in its cause is grievously sinful or not, one must consider to what extent the action tends of its very nature towards producing such pleasure, and whether there exists proportionally grave reasons for doing this said act. Practical examples will be considered below when discussing looks, touches, etc. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at the internal sins of impurity. So he says there are three internal 
sins of impurity, taking pleasure in a modest imaginations, taking pleasure in sins of impurity and unchaste desires. So first one, taking pleasure in imaginative representations of impure actions is grievously sinful since it represents a deliberate desire for the impure action itself, even though this is not performed externally. Unless these impure thoughts are accompanied by evil desires, they receive their specific character from the object alone, not from the circumstances. At least this is the opinion of the fo- of to be followed in practice. Therefore, it is quite sufficient for the penitent to accuse himself of taking pleasure in so many impure thoughts without giving an accurate description of the objects of such thoughts. So essentially what this is saying, again, my friends, is that taking deliberate pleasure, right, in the imagination, right, in some type of impure image, right, if we're conjuring um, impure uh, images in our mind, if you will, or if we see an impure image out and about in the world uh, in some form or fashion, and we take delib- we deliberately, right, desire to um, take an impure action, right, or we um, take some type of impure imagination inside ourselves, right, this is always grievously sinful, right, that's the first kind. The second right here, he says, deliberate complacency in previous sins of impurity, such as the act of adultery receives a specific character both of from the object and from the differing circumstances, differentiating circumstances of the sinful object. Consequently, it would not be sufficient for the penitent to accuse himself of taking pleasure in previous sinful actions of impurity. He must state what those actions were. Such complacency manifests approval of the previous act and thus possesses the same specific morality as the act itself, right? So if we go back and we think upon a time in which some person, whether it would be us, right, or some other person was to take in pleasure, or was excuse me, to take pleasure in a certain full sinful action that they had done in the past, right? This would be mortally sinful as well. And then number three, right here, unchaste desires, right? Unchaste desires are acts of complacency in the performance of some future sinful act of impurity. They are two different types, right? So he's now going to distinguish these types. Efficacious desires uh, present in the one who genuinely intends to commit the evil contemplated, and inefficacious desires, which represent a mere wish to do those acts, right? Such desires receive their specific sinfulness both from their object and differentiating circumstances of the object. Therefore, the confession, therefore, in the confessional, the penitent should state the object of his evil desires, at least if this is morally possible, right? So these are going to be the, um, right, if you will, internal, right, sins of impurity, right? And when it comes to this latter thing, it would be people who have some type of impure desire, whether they act upon them or whether they don't act upon them, right? These are going to be impure and therefore mortally sinful. So now he gets into unconsummated external sins of impurity, right? So he says, unconsummated sins of impurity are those that fall short of the full sexual act. They include sexual motions, as well as acts of immodesty. So he says this, sexual or venereal motions are disturbance of the genital organs and the fluids in these organs. They are usually accompanied by some slight external stellation. Moral nature of such motions, right? So what is what is the moral nature of this? He says, if they are directly willed, they are grievously sinful since they are, uh, they are a form of venereal pleasure directly willed, right? So if someone is directly willing some type of um, sexual or carnal motion inside of them, right? Again, outside of the confines of holy matrimony, right? That this would be mortally sinful, right? Again, that's why he says grievously sinful. If they are completely involuntary, no sin is committed, right? We have to recognize, my frifriends, that because of man's t- woundedness uh, and even just because of his nature, there will be certain things which will tempt a man and will even, in a certain sense, uh, produce motions, carnal motions inside of the a man's body. And these motions, uh, you know, if they are not uh, intended directly, right, if they are involuntary, if this is maybe just, say, a natural response to something, are not sinful in and of themselves. We have to recognize that there is a threefold process when it comes to these things, right? There is, for instance, when we think of um, impure thoughts, we can b- break this down to three things, right? There is uh, a temptation, right, that is presented toward man. A temptation in and of itself is not sinful, for our Lord in Matthew chapter 4 was tempted by the devil. However, there's a temptation, right, which you can think of as step number one. Step number two, you could call delectation, 
right? Which is in a certain sense, taking uh, pleasure in a certain sense. Uh, this could be a natural pleasure or an immoral pleasure, right? That can be arisen from some type of image or, or thought or imaginative sense. And then there is the action, right? Or the consent, right? The first one is not sinful. And the second one, in certain instances, when it comes to matters that are not involving the sixth and ninth commandment, uh, are not necessarily sinful. But when it comes to the sixth and ninth commandment, because the proximity, right, of um, our fallen human nature and the grievousness of this sin, we have to, as uh, St. Alfonso says, give positive, right, or full-on willful resistance to any type of um, sexual delectation or delight that we could receive outside of the context or confines of marriage, right? This is, again, something that we have to realize. Again, this is not including these maybe carnal motions, right? The body reacting in a certain natural sense to something being there. The choice is, though, am I going to subordinate these reactions that my body is giving to the dictates of reason, right? And reason command the will and say, I will not engage in X, Y, or Z, right? If that helps make sense. He says now, uh, to continue, he says with here with three, if they are voluntary in the cause of their sinfulness, they can be judged from the principles governing acts and are indirectly voluntary. Such, such sexual uh, motives are generally controlled easily and eff uh, effectively if their cause is removed so far as that it is possible and the mind turns to other matters. Right, so now he gets into, he says, external acts of immodesty are those which normally have some close connection with or some influence on sexual pleasures, such as immodest looks or touches, right? So you can see how these actions, right, these immodest looks and touches are generally connected to some type of carnal delectation or pleasure, right? Then those would be grievously sinful and therefore we should get rid of them. He says, such acts are not immodest in themselves and therefore are permissible for certain sufficient reasons, such as when they are performed by doctors or midwives, right? So there can be certain contexts in which a person can, because of necessity, right, have to engage in looking at different um, faculties of the human person. However, uh, that's going to be an exception to the rule, right? He says, but it follows with certainty from what has been said previously, right, that such actions are evil when done for the sake of exciting, right, a carnal pleasure. However, the further question arises whether such acts are sinful when performed not for the sake of exciting unlawful pleasure, nor for any just reason, but solely from curiosity or playfulness, right? And this is what he he kind of clarifies this. He says, moral theologians usually distinguish between those parts of the body which are becoming and which are exposed to the sight of all, such as the face and the hands, right? The face and the hands of every person, right? Unless you're um, right in a, in a country, uh, let's just say over in the Middle East, right? Uh, where there's a certain religion, right? Because we don't want to be banned off of YouTube, uh, where there's a certain religion where, let's just say, put it bluntly, uh, you don't want to see women at all, um, right? That's an extreme, but uh, we do have this reality of like, faces and hands, right? Everyone sees them, right? And this would be okay. But he says parts of the body which are less becoming, right? And usually covered by clothing, such as the breasts or the arms, and those parts of the body which are indecent, right? The organs of generation, right? Uh, the adjunct parts, right? These organs that are made for the reproductive act, right? Those organs and those other um, parts of the body which are very much so going to be associated with that are going to be very much so um, indecent and unbecoming to the sight of um, of man and therefore should be covered to, in keeping with that said virtue of modesty. He says, now the general rule, all acts of immodesty which are done without sufficient reason and an evil intent are sinful to the extent that they cause a proximate danger and venereal pleasure. The gravity of this danger must be determined, uh, A, from the nature of the act and B, from the disposition of the agent. The following points may be borne in mind regarding particular types of acts, right? So he says, for instance, right here, number one, normal kissing, which follows the custom of a country is lawful. This is an example, but abnormal or ardent or passionate is a way you could say kissing usually gives rise to the danger of sexual pleasure and is therefore gravely unlawful, right? This is something that um, I really do wish that more priests would talk about, not just in the confessional, but on their homilies is this reality that passionate kissing is as it says here in the traditional moral theology right is gives way to a grave danger right and is gravely unlawful right it is mortally sinful because it exposes one said person to an action 
right, which is uh, intended or ordered for reproduction, right, which can only take place in the confines of holy matrimony. His second example, he says, touching the indecent parts of another adult for an evil purpose and without necessity is gravely forbidden, right? Casually touching the same parts of one's own body or less becoming parts for another's body would seem to be venially sinful since the danger of unlawful venereal pleasure is not so grave, at least in normal circumstances. If these touches are inspired by an evil intention, then these acts are impure and therefore grievously sinful. Touching animals in decency must be judged according to the intention and disposition of the agent. The immodest touching of another is determined in its moral aspects by the character of the person who is touched immodestly uh, with, die, uh, with die evil intentions of incest or adultery. This is not untrue of immodest looks unless accompanied by evil desires of touching the person. It says the immodest touching of another is determined in its moral aspect by the character of the person who is touched immodestly. He says this looks are less likely to cause the danger of venereal pleasure than touching. I would say that might have been true maybe in the 1920s, but now it is much more of an egregious thing, especially in the context of Western society. He says, nevertheless, to look at the indecent parts of an adult of the opposite sex, evil intent is grievously sinful, right? So this obviously involves not just uh, the sin of um, pornography, but also just uh, out and about, if you will, in your everyday life and looking at this. He says, one can be less severe in one's judgment on looking at statues of pictures, right, of people who are undressed, since artificial things do not usually excite a person so much as natural objects. However, it is self-evident that even such looks can give a rise to severe temptations and therefore are to be avoided unless uh, there exist sufficient reasons. It does not seem grievously sinful to look at the indecent parts of oneself or at those of another of the person of the same sex without sufficient reason, provided there is no impure desire, right? This has to be something that we even have to put upon ourselves and say, am I doing this toward myself? He now goes on into immodest conversations, right? This is maybe something that we don't think about as much when we're discussing these said subjects, but he says, in modest conversations regarding obscene matters with the intention to excite or to or uh to excite to lust or with the danger of grave scandal is grievously sinful, right? However, it is often difficult to decide whether such bad conversation is grievously sinful or not, since the danger of sexual pleasure arrives depends so much on the varied circumstances both of the speaker and of his audience. The same applies to reading bad books and attending the theater or the opera, right? This point right here, St. Alphonsus mentions quite a bit, and this is something that will be shocking, right, if you will, to the average Catholic who maybe hasn't been exposed to this. This reality of comedy shows or going to certain operas or bad books, right, especially like romance novels, that in a positive light, um, joke about or make light of these issues of impurity right, ought to be avoided at all costs because these are uh, putting you in the proximate occasion of sin, right? The proximate danger of sin. This is something that we have to recognize and avoid with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. He now says, familiarity between persons of the different sexes. Such behavior is common between persons contem uh, contemplating marriage and is frequently the source of sexual pleasure. The confessor should keep the follow general rules before him. One fun fact, if you will, uh, if you want to call it that, to know about the said subject is that um, courtship is, according to Catholic moral theology, an occasion of sin, right? It is something that can lead to sins. However, is in a certain sense necessary because if courtship doesn't exist and if marriage doesn't exist, um, then there is no proper outlet, right, with the latter case, uh, for the reproduction of children, right? And so therefore, it is something that is necessary. But for all those who are inside of a season of courtship or maybe giving advice to those who are in courtship, applying these rules would be very helpful. So the confessor, right, he's instructed with these two things. He says, number one, if sexual pleasure is intended, right, and said an action, let's just say in the context of uh, two people contemplating being married, such behavior is grievously sinful and therefore is to be forbidden. This is clear from what has been said already, right? If you are in a dating or courtship scenario, right, and your um, significant other or yourself, um, you're doing actions that are intended toward carnal delectation or, or carnal pleasure, right? If you are willfully intending these things, or if they are, right, then these is grievously or mortally sinful, right? This goes to show you the reality and the dangers that are involved 
inside of courtship, right? Your significant other should be absolutely treating you with the utmost uh, sense of respect, chastity, and modesty. And if this person is not, right, if this is somebody where frequently you both are falling into these types of sins, then you need to cut it off, right? You need to cut it off because that person or maybe yourself can't control themselves. And so they do need to spend some time mastering uh, by the help of God's grace, the said virtue of chastity. He gives a second principle and he says, if venereal pleasure is not merely intended, but also uh, strenuously avoided, mutual signs of affection are permissible, right? Such as kissing, embracing, words of affection, right? Some of you might be saying, well, Nicholas, didn't you just say, right, that kissing and things like that should be off limits? Well, notice the language again here. He says, if venereal pleasure, right, is not merely intended, but also strenuously avoided. What does strenuously mean? Strenuously mean, means like, um, you know, uh, you know, um, we are, um, we are greatly, or we are putting, uh, we are exerting ourselves strongly, right? Um, if you're avoiding these things strongly, right, then certain mutual signs of affection can, in certain circumstances, be permissible, right? I don't think there's anything wrong with a holding hands if you both are already strongly and strenuously avoiding carnal delectations from these things. I don't think giving that person a hug is necessarily bad or words of affection. However, if you both aren't, right, strenuously avoiding these venereal pleasures, and if you both aren't, right, um, keeping yourselves chaste, then this is something where, no, you shouldn't be engaging in these things at all. He says now, number three, he says, it is, uh, if this familiar behavior is occasionally, but not always the proximate occasion of sin, it should not be forbidden immediately under pain of denying absolution, but the confessor should first inquire whether such acts are morally necessary. In these circumstances, the confessor should warn the penitent to refrain from anything which is the proximate cause of lust and to take the necessary precautions. If such behavior which gives rise to occasional sin is neither necessary nor really useful, the confessor should strictly forbid it. What it's saying here is two great things. I'll start with the latter. Number one, right? If, well, actually, I guess I'll start with the first one, really. When we look at dating or when we look at courtship, we have to recognize that if this person is causing us or leading us into some type of carnal delectation, right? And when I say leading us into, I mean, they are willfully trying to get us by words, by actions, etc., to participate in, say, words or actions that are impure, then that is something, and this is um, something that is repeated, right, often, common, etc., then you need to shut it down and you need to break up with that person for the salvation of your soul and for the salvation of their own soul. And you need to warn that person, right, warn them of the problems that they are going to be inflicting upon themselves, right? We see, what does Holy Scripture say? Uh, John chapter 3, verse 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that does not obey the Son shall not receive life, but the wrath of God abideth on him, right? We have to recognize that the wrath of God abides on all those who willfully take pleasure in unrighteousness, as uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, I believe, talks about, right? That God will send down wrath upon those who are impure, right? Impurity is not a joke. But at the same time, if this thing is, say, infrequent, right? It's very infrequent. You need to be very careful. We don't want any of it, right? We don't want any of it. But if it's infrequent, then maybe it does not cause at least when it comes to, you know, breaking up with that person. However, him speaking to confessors, one thing I find it interesting is he talks about, yeah, if if this is something that's frequent, then you need as a confessor, as a priest to withhold absolution from that person until they are to break up with that person or get rid of that occasion of sin. If it's something that is very rarely, then it doesn't necessarily warrant it. That's something that is crazy to the mind of so many priests and maybe seminarians who are in our own day now, this idea of not absolving everyone who comes to them. But what does our Lord say, right, in the Holy Gospel according to St. John, right, when he gives the power to the apostles to forgive, to remit sin, he also gives them the power to retain sin. Whosoever sins you forgive are forgiven, whosoever sins you retain are retained, right? There are times where it is more charitable to, ret to retain or to not remit, to not absolve the sins of a person than to absolve them, right? Because we do not want for that person to go on living in a presumptuous way. Presumption is a blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. We do not want a person to fall into that. So therefore, when it comes to this most grievous of sins, this sin that preys upon our natural inclinations, this sin of impurity, the confessor ought to be very wary of these things. 
But we, also the laity, in humility and respect for those who are above us, also need to take these principles in the context of what we do on a practical level. Should we be with this person or should we not be with this person? Lust is not a joke, my friends. Lust is a sin which damns souls to hell, and we need to recognize this. Now, he says here, he says, gets into naturally consummated sins of impurity. Let me give a huge disclaimer here. When he says natural, he is not saying natural in the context of normal, happy, healthy, good. That's not what he's saying, right? Natural in this context in Thomistic language means that by doing this said action, a child could be conceived. That's all that it means. It does not mean that this action is good. It does not mean that this action is honorable, right? This is why he says sins right here. I just want to clarify that because I do see how oftentimes the atheist will blast um, scholasticism for this, which uh, it is just really it comes down to you know all due respect to those who disagree, but it just does come down to straw manning of the argument as opposed to fully understanding the argument. So when he says natural, he is not saying natural is in good. He is saying natural in the sense in the sense that by doing this said action, a child could technically be conceived, right? It takes a man and a woman to conceive a child, right? And through some action, whether that be an action of purity, right, in the context of marriage, or an action of impurity in the context of say what we're going to be talking about, right? A child could be conceived, right, in these said actions. That's all that it means. So in this first one right here. Uh, some of these I'm going to read out loud. Some of them I'm not going to, and the reason I'm not going to uh, is mainly due to the fact that YouTube can, you know, if you uh, if you say some of these things, but you can read them uh, as you can see. Um, so with the, when it comes to this first one, uh, this one I think is probably fine. Uh, when it comes to the sins of fornication, right? Fornication is voluntarily sexual intercourse between an unmarried man and a woman who is no longer virgo intacta, right? The fact of intrinsic evil as is in, uh, evident from the Proposition 48, condemned by Innocent the 11th, right? This proposition, you believe, I do believe, uh, comes even in St. Alphonsus's moral theology works, but it, this uh, condemnation reads as thus, quote, It appears so evident that fornication in itself contains no evil and is only evil because of its for it is forbidden and on the contrary seems opposed to reason, right? right? This is a condemned proposition, what he's saying. He says the internal reason for the sinfulness of fornication is that of itself it causes grave injury to the welfare of the child and to the welfare of society, notwithstanding that sometimes for accidental reasons such injuries do not arise. We can prove from just reason that fornication makes no sense, my friends. We don't need the Holy Scriptures, although the Holy Scriptures are above reason, um, so I'm not trying to demean the Holy Scriptures. But we do, we can have from just reason alone that fornication makes absolutely no sense. Right, the purpose of human sexuality and reproduction is for the said purpose of reproduction. You look at all of the um, faculties and the inseminations and uh, pollutions that take place inside of the conjugal act, and it's all geared toward reproduction. Therefore, if reproduction is the primary end of the conjugal act, we can deduce from reason that the parents who were involved in that said conception ought to therefore right, be bound by some type of law of reason or law of justice to take care of and to watch over and to raise and to guard that child. Right? We see this in nature. right? We just don't see this when it comes to humanity because of humanity's woundedness. Right? This is where grace builds upon nature and why we need something more than just our natural faculties. We need supernatural grace. Without getting more into that, we can see right, fornication right, is a sin. Under fornication are included con concubinage and prostitution, as adding a graving circumstances to sin, right? Both of them being uh, absolutely forbidden and evil, right? Concubinage and prostitution. The second sin right here, down, down number five, nine, uh, 519, I'm not going to list off because of the said uh, nature of YouTube, but right, this sin, right, is understood in three different senses. First is the unlawful, right, um, ravishing of a virgin with her consent, right? Um, two, it is the ravishing of a virgin contrary to her will. And number three, for complete carnal activity with any woman contrary to her will. In this latter sense is the word to be used in the civil codes of law, right? It is always simple. He says this sin, right, understood in its meaning, in its first meaning, is ag uh, aggravating circumstances added to the sin of fortification. But ordinarily speaking, it does not involve the consummation of an additional mortal sin, which must be mentioned in confession, as is the opinion of the former theologians. Right, This sin, understood in the second and third meaning of the word 
listed sum includes an addition to evil fornication as grievous injustice, sin of injustice, since it is an act of violence, right? Basically, what we can see here is that this particular sin involves the, the former sin, right, of fornication, but it adds a step, right? And we need to be specific, right, when it comes to defining these things and the person, right, if they have engaged in this heinous and evil action, right, not only need to repent uh, and need to confess this to a priest, but also needs to turn themselves into the law, right? They need to turn themselves in to the civil government to be punished, right, justly for this said evil action, Um I think that when it comes to this action, our society needs to have much stronger uh, and more vigorous um, condemnations and punishments for these people. I generally tend toward the position that um, individuals that engage in this said action need to um, either have uh, need to either ex receive extremely long uh, prison sentences or uh, need to be executed, some type of action like that. Now it gets into abduction, right? This is kind of maybe a bit different. You might think abduction, what does that mean? I, I don't get it. He says, abduction is the forcible removal of a person for the purpose of committing, right, this said sin against in chastity. Uh, abduction is grave sin, both against justice, right, against that virtue of justice, because it is unjust forced use, right, against chastity. Those who commit it, uh, this act are punished by civil and canonical law, right, and rightly so. People ought to be punished for those things. Uh, this next one I'm not going to list off out loud because, again, of potential censoring issues, but this sin, right, this sin right here, uh, you can see paragraph 251. He says, in this sin is uh, intercourse between persons related to each other who are unable to enter into marriage. There are four ways in which this person may be related to each other, relationship by blood, spiritual relationship, legal relationship, affinity, right? This sin committed against the persons related to each other in the first and second degrees involves the consummation of two great sins, both of which must be confessed, one against chastity, another against piety, right? This sin committed against persons related to each other in more distant degrees, adds an aggravating aspect. He now gets into carnal sacrifice, right? Carnal sacrilege is the violation of sacred persons by, a, by a person's place or by an act contrary to chastity. He says, such sufficient explanation has already been given of personal sacrilege, carnal sacrilege, or real sacrilege, right? An example of real sacrilege committed by an unchaste act of solicitation in the confessional, cardinal sacrilege is grievously sinful on two accounts. It is a serious sin against chastity and a serious sin against religion, right? Now he gives the final one. This is probably the one that we're more familiar with um, in the context of our civil society. He says, adultery is right intercourse between per two persons, at least whom uh, one of whom is married. Two serious sins are committed, one against chastity and the other against justice. Since the adulterer seriously injures the right of his uh, of his spouse, the sufficient uh, the specific sinfulness of adultery is to be found uh, in the acts of married persons who touches another immodestly, who act unnaturally uh, unnaturally that uh, with that person, or who has evil desires toward that person. Right. So now he gets into specifically the unnatural consummated sins of impurity. Right. The unnatural being. Um, by these said actions, right, it is impossible for the procuring of a child or for the faculties in the conjugal act to achieve its reproductive end. He says the natural uh, committed, uh, the unnatural committed sins of impurity, the unnatural committed uh, consummated sins against purity are pollution, uh, sodomy, and bestiality. These are regarded as unnatural acts since they are contrary to the natural purpose of the sexual act, right, which we've talked about, the procreation of children. Therefore, as sins of impurity, they are more serious than others, right? So these are more serious in many in many ways because it, in a certain sense, it cannot even fulfill, right, the purpose for which um, the, uh, the, the conjugal act is wired for, right, that being the procreation of children. So first and foremost, right, he talks about specifically sexual pollution, right? He says it's also t uh, termed by doctors, right, as Onism, masturbation, right? Is this uh, the is the emission of seed or the equivalent outside of sexual intercourse? We say this uh, the emission of seed for this equivalent pollution, strictly so called, is to be found only, uh, I believe, in men who have reached the age of puberty, since these alone are capable of secreting seed in the proper uh, sense of the word, 
that it is in the wider meaning of pollution in a word implied to the emission of that which is equivalent to seed, the emission of any fluid which is accompanied by venereal pleasure, and which may occur in women, eunuchs, and those who have not reached the age of puberty. Moral evil of either form of pollution seems almost the same. However, in pollution strictly so called, there is also an additional evil of a useless emission of seed contrary to the natural order, right? And so now he gives a little bit more specifics. He says, pollution, when it is directly willed, is always grievously sinful, right? So this action of pollution, right, that is extremely common in the day in which we are living in, right, uh, when it is directly willed, is always a mortally sin, right? It's always a mortal sin. This is so key to stress on because I have heard so many horror stories from friends of mine and from just commenters here on YouTube, uh, just uh, books that I've read, where the, because of the lack of true formation in the new seminaries, they are actually, on the contrary, right, teaching the opposite against the said things, right? They are, they're saying situations like well you know if you're addicted to these type of immoral behaviors you know your your intellect is not fully there your will is not fully there so you know it's not necessarily grievously sinful that's wrong my friends it is always grievously sinful and he says why because it is directly willing of sexual pleasure the way in which it is procured has little bearing on its moral character provided that there is no desire for sodomy bestiality cooperation or another means which is of, na of nature itself forbidden, right? He says, second, the sinfulness of pollution, which is voluntary in its cause, must be judged according to the principles which, aptly, uh, which apply to acts that are indirectly voluntary. Therefore, one has to consider whether the action resulting from pollution is in itself morally good, such as washing, swimming, riding, etc., or whether the purpose of this action is morally good, whether there is sufficient reason for performing the action. Right, he says, number three, pollution may occur during sleep, not of sinfulness, unless it is willed by some way. Right, this is very much so common for men. He says, in the practice of upright men, of uh, in, in practice, men of upright life need not be disturbed by these nocturnal emissions, even if they uh, occur when they are half awake. Right, this is something that, uh, for scrupulous souls, can be very helpful to recognize because if you're striving. In the natural, uh, in the supernatural life, and you're not um, falling into these said sins, right? And you're resisting these things, and eventually, right, a nocturnal emission was to take place, right? This would not be a sin in and of itself, uh, provided that, right? And I, and I don't know if he he mentions this in here fully, but I remember Saint Alphonsus mentions this, uh, as well as Saint Thomas Aquinas when they were both treating this. If a person was to say wake up from those said experiences and take a certain amount of pleasure in the knowledge that they were doing that said action, right? Some type of impure pleasure in that, that would be mortally sinful, right? So you need to be careful, right? You need to, you need to watch out for these things. So what are the remedies, right? He's going to now get into some of the remedies for these things as we close. The remedies for pollution. It is evident from experience that the sinful, that the sin of pollution is widespread amongst young persons of both genders, right? And cannot be easily checked. It is of supreme importance, right? The highest importance that the confessor save from despondency anyone who habitually falls into this sin. He must uh, be encouraged to persevere in the firm conviction of that victory is possible and to remain faithful by all means suggested by the confessor. Such remedies are supernatural, moral, natural, and hygienic, right? So he gets into specifically these, but before we do, you can find victory in these said things, right? This is something that you have to no, because if you don't, right, if you don't believe you can ever be free from your sin, then you will never be free from your sin. Uh, as we're going to get to uh, a little bit further on, I'm going to give a little bit of a story of a person uh, that I know as an example of this, right, um, when it comes to not believing that they can be free from their sins who can never be uh, recovered from this. So we'll get into a little bit of that in a second. He says right here, so the first, right, the supernatural moral remedies are frequent reception of the sacraments. Daily exercise of piety, right? So that includes prayer, fasting, etc. Avoidance of all the occasion of sin and idleness, a horror and loathing of this vice. So let's get into some of the practicals. What does this all mean? So fervent reception of the sacraments. If you are fortunate enough, right, to live near a traditional parish, right, where you have a traditional Latin mass, then that is the place that you're wanting to be. If you don't live around one of those things, that's going to still be a place that you want to be at. But here's what you need to do. 
you need to have frequent reception for the sacrament. So let's just say, right, you are in an area in which you have available to you every single day, right, your parish, the traditional Latin Mass. You need to be going every single day and receiving the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, right, making acts of faith, hope, and charity before and after receiving Holy Communion. And you need to be going to confession often. I recommend following St. Alphonsus' principle and going to confession twice a week if you struggle with this sin, right? Fighting against it and, and, and going to confession twice a week and going to communion frequently. He also says the daily exercise of piety, right? So making sure that you're praying. My biggest tip for you, especially if you struggle with this or even if you don't struggle with this, but I just think is very good for a person to know, is going to specifically be praying the 15 decades of the rosary every single day every single day, as well as taking up fasting, fasting from meats and um, dairy products on, you know, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, frequent fasting. He also says, uh, uh, avoid the occasions of sins, right? If your computer is an occasion of sin, if your iPhone is, a can, is an occasion of sin, if there are books or movies in your house, or uh, if there are people in your life that are occasion of sins, then get rid of them or cut them off. That's all you have to do. You have to do these things to save your soul. He also goes up with uh, avoid idleness, right? I, as the old saying goes, idle hands are the devil's workshop. I think it was St. Jerome who said that, but I could be wrong. But it's so true, right? If we're going to be lounging around all day, that's going to dispose us way more to sin as opposed to, um, to, to not, right? And then he says, finally, having a horror and loathing for this vice, right? You need to hate this vice, and you need to pray that God will give you chastity, right? You need to beg God and ask him to give you and to make you chaste, as well as you need to beg God and ask him to give you a loathing and a horror for this said vice, right? Those are the supernatural methods. He now gives the natural methods, which we'll not go into a ton of detail with, but he says the bodily exercise, right, uh, causing moderate physical fatigue, right, cold baths, right, or cold showers, a hard bed, which is not too warm, sleep on one's right side with his hands resting on his breast, prompting, uh, prompt rising in the morning at a stated hour, the avoidance of any food or drink, which is too rich or stimulating, the use of medicines, which quiet the nerves. If pollution is frequent as the results from bodily unhealthiness, a doctor should be consulted who is to know what is to be best and right uh, for the man's upright conscience, right? There are these natural methods. I definitely want to just spend a second and say, point out, getting up at a certain time, going bed at a certain time, taking cold showers, right? Uh, doing a good hard day's work, right? This kind of moderate physical fatigue, right? That is all good things which are going to help. All right, so now we get into the uh, the golden calf of the secular age, the the sin that every uh, you know person wants to worship today, the sin in which uh, it cries to heaven for God's wrath. Um, I'm not going to again uh, get too much into the detail of these things. I do have a video planned on this said subject, but the sin of sodomy, right? Sometimes called pedetary or the unnatural vice is the unnatural and carnal intercourse between male and another person, right? If this person is a male, sodomy is said to be perfect. If this person is a female, two females, if you will, this is an imperfect sodomy, right? Sodomy cries to heaven for vengeance. The following section, uh, the following section on sexual perversion, right? Which we'll get into specifically a bit more on homosexuality in a second. But to state this bluntly and clearly, homosexuality is a sin regardless of what the world wants to say they're wrong they're completely wrong and they're wrong as well as the german bishops and the belgian bishops who want to placate and to downplay the horror of this said sin right it is a sin which cries to heaven for vengeance for god's wrath for god's judgment right if you are an individual who struggles with this said sin then you need to take into practice those above mentioned helps and the below mentioned helps which we're going to be talking about right but you need to flee from this sin and the biggest thing you need to pray to god to give you a desire for cha to be chaste as well as to live in a chaste lifestyle as well as specifically you believing that you can become free from this i have personal friends who i have seen completely be freed from this said vice of sodomy right and i have had friends in my life who have not been freed right and who are now on the way to hell because they don't believe that they can become free from the said sin, right? This is a sin like any other sin that if one continues to partake in it, will damn a soul, right? I do not want to sugarcoat it to you guys. You can find redemption, but the, only, the people out there who want redemption, right? You're only going to want 
a healer. You're only going to want medicine if you truly hate the disease. You only are going to go to a doctor if you know that you're sick. If you think that you were just born a certain way, right, and it's just an alternative lifestyle or whatever, you are not going to be free from your sin, my friends. You're not going to, right? This is something that you have to recognize. It's not going to happen. He now goes on and he said, bestiality is intercourse with an animal, right? A human and an animal. And it is the most grievous act of all the sins against chastity. This sin is not uh, this sin is not committed if, while touching an animal, pollution takes place without performing or unwilling the full sexual act, right? So he says this, sexual perversion, right? In practice, the confessor should acquaint himself with the teaching of the recent authors on sexual perversion, which uh, consists in unnatural acts against chastity and easily becomes almost a pathological, meaning a mental condition, which is not easily re uh, remedied. The, the more important forms of sexual perversion are, right, and he lists them off here, but I just want to rec recognize that these said sins, right, which we're going to finish on, are pathological conditions, right? They are mental disorders. These are issues that the person really needs to recognize if they're going to grapple and to fight this thing. So the first one he says is sadism, right? Is also called the uh, the pervert count de sede, right? Which consists in infliction or cruelty on another in order to excite oneself to veneer of pleasure, right? It may consist in striking, wounding, or killing a person, right? There are weirdos out there. There are really evil, wicked souls who are out there, and they need to repent, right? They need to repent, and they need to turn themselves into the authorities. In a good and just and holy society, right, these people would be arrested, right? He says masochism, right? He says, which is the voluntary infliction of cruelty on oneself uh, by another in order to assure, right, some form of pleasure. For instance, a woman may ask another to beat her so that her passions may be aroused, right? This is something which is grievously evil. Fetishism, right, which consists in the lustful actions for something such as exciting the pleasures by touching a woman's dress or shoes or hair, right? These form of perversions is frequently in a pathological state, right, a mental disordered state. Homosexuality, right, being the uh, the god, if you will, little g, right, the god, the devil, right, uh, which is a strong sexual inclination toward persons of the same sex, right, is the attraction from one to another, uh, or from one man to another, or from one female to another. Such perversion, when existing in females, is used uh, used to be called lesbianism, vice, right, etc. His final paragraph, which we'll read, and then we'll get into. Uh, my, my closing thoughts, he says, in some instances, right, this perversion seems almost innate, right, built into the person, right, that this is who they are. In others, it is acquired by acts of gross impurity, right, maybe they were injured, right, in some former context, maybe, maybe you struggle with one of these things, and you were grievously violated when you were younger, right, you were grievously violated by a family member, or by uh, another wicked person, right, maybe it was even a priest, right, these wicked, um, false wolves, and in, uh, in sheep's clothing, right, these false prophets, right, he says, and the others is the, uh, the cause of genuine psychological or pathological condition. However, it is most rare that such perversion complete, completely disturbs the balance of the mind, and thus the agent must be regarded as responsible for the uh, consequent acts of impurity, right? You are responsible, my friends, is what he's saying. The confessor must show great patience and prudence in the guidance of such persons if they desire to escape from their evil habit. All right, my friends. So that's going to be a little bit of the moral theology, but I want us to recognize this. Deliberate delectation or um, actions, right, which are ordered toward uh, procreation and which take place outside of the natural bonds of marriage in all of these categories are grievously sinful, right? This deliberate intention to do so. We have to recognize, my friends, that we live in a world and in an age which is completely engulfed in this wickedness and this filth, right? We live in a world and an age in which worships these said sins and vices with a paramount um, hierarchical approach of placing this as the would-be end-all of all actions in this said life. And this is something that I find extremely sad and extremely worrying. My friends, we cannot, as a society, continue to go forward and expect good times in the head. So what is the solution, right? We, we've talked a little bit about the practical solutions about this, but I want to just speak to you now, the viewer, a little bit from my heart. My friends, you cannot become free from these sins, right, unless you accept, number one, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel being that you and yourself, apart from God's grace, are an enemy of God. 
are a child of the devil and are you're on your way, right? If you've committed sins, right? If you've committed these mortal sins, if you're in a state of original sin, right? If you've not been received the grace of baptism, right? you're on your way to eternal perdition, right? Which we call hell. And that's not something that is pleasant. Hell is not a place that was made for man, but was made, according to St. Matthew, for the devil and his angels, right? This is something which is a place that you do not want to go to. However, there is a way out, right? And that is through the death of his son. You see, my friends, when we commit sin, we don't just do a little damage to ourselves or a little imperfection here and there. Rather, we offend God's eternal justice. God is love in his own essence and nature, but God is also justice in his own essence and nature. And we owe God the justice that he deserves. But when we sin, we commit an action of injustice against God, and therefore the just thing to do is to enact that said justice upon us. If, we, if, we, if I break a window, my friends, I ought to, according to justice, pay for that window. But if I kill a man, my friends, then I ought to be put to death for killing that man. But if I offend an infinite being, then I deserve to be separated from that infinite being forever. And if I offend that which is all beautiful, which is all lovely, which is all good, then I deserve to be in a place that is not beautiful, that is not good, that is not pleasant to be in, a place of torment. And my friend, these sins, these vices lead us to that. But how does man get out? The beautiful thing of the gospel is that you can't pay for the justice that you owe God. But Christ, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, came down to earth lived a perfect life, and died on a cross to offer to God the justice that you could never give him. He died for you, my friends, so that you could live with him in heaven, but that you wouldn't just live in heaven, but that you could also be transformed in this life. So my friends, if you're not someone who has been baptized uh, inside of the church, if you're not someone who is a member of the Catholic faith, I recommend seeking out your closest parish and seeking at entrance into the family of God, right? What do you do, right? Our Lord says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, right? You need to be, you need to repent. You need to turn away. That's what repentance means. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change one's mind. You need to change your mind and stop these actions of sin. You need to be baptized. And if you are a Catholic and you've fallen into a state of mortal sin, run to confession, Run to confession because that is the only place that you can actually truly have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that today was helpful for you guys and that you were able to not just learn some things but also reflect on the grievousness of these sins but also have a little bit of hope and recognize what to do when it comes to these sins. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video or you at least liked the information that was presented, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. And uh, if you're not a member of the traditional Thomas channel, we'd love to have you aboard. So go ahead and make a subscription, put on the post notification bell and all that other fun YouTube stuff that everyone's supposed to say. Finally, if you believe in the said work of this show and kind of bringing to the forefront these tough issues of Catholic theology, then go ahead and consider supporting us down at patreon.com forward slash traditional Thomas. Get information and resources that can help you in the spiritual life. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Hope this was helpful for you. Know of my prayers for you. May our Lord bless you, our lady keep you, and St. Joseph watch over and protect you. God bless.